to be honest, right, the only real reason I talked to Eugene is to try to be able to convince and provide social proof that I can buy more expensive camera gear, right? <laughs> I can't turn down. Uh, it's a tool of creativity. That's right. Let's get started. So uh, good to see you all at the town hall. Just for quick background, we're DK and Mishti, and we're from the Highlighter team. And we're building Highlighter as a place to gather to read and discuss great writing. These town halls are a way to bring writers into the mix to jam with us and dig deeper on their ideas. We've recently been doing a few sessions with more deeply researched blog pieces like Eugene's work on what has made TikTok work on his blog, Remains of the Day. And we'll send a link to that in chat. Yep, dropping the link in. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited because these pieces obviously look at TikTok, but if you take a step back, I think they're really about how our social lives online are changing. Like, how do we communicate with one another? And what are the implications of new designs and reliance on algorithm on our relationships and sort of how we exist as creators out there? So there is definitely a lot to unpack here. So thanks, Eugene, for coming. Thanks for having me. Now, quick note on the format. The magic of the town hall is when we keep it really participatory. So we'll kick it off uh, with some questions, but please do chime in with ideas and questions on the chat. And we'll welcome you up live to unmute and ask your questions directly. And uh, also as an FYI, we are recording this session and streaming it live to YouTube. We're making a video so that people who, can, uh, who can't make it tonight can still learn from the discussion even if they couldn't attend. And I always get lots of requests after the fact for links to the YouTube video, so uh, it will be watched. So we're gonna hand it over to James to intro Eugene and kick us off, but I do have a question for everyone on chat, which is who was the first TikTok influencer that you ever heard of? I hope everyone knows at least one. We were going to ask you if you could name five, but we thought that would be hopeless. <laughs> Just one. But yeah, to James. Okay, so I think we're all in for a treat. I think that one of my, the only thing better than Eugene's blog posts are probably talking to Eugene. One of my favorite stories was talking to him about a very senior CEO of one of the most successful companies in the world in his early days, trying to convince people to do something. And he said to me, you know, this guy was so insightful on the one hand, but could not figure out how to get his whole company aligned around something. And so he spent a bunch of time trying to distill complicated ideas into something really simple that he can repeat over and over to like his team and to his company so they would be effective and focused for the year. And what's interesting to me is that Eugene has basically been doing that through his blog for all of us, right? That he's taken very complicated, sort of really interesting strategic insights and questions. And then on the one hand, he's written, managed to write like 10,000 words about it, but he's also managed to boil it down to a few key concepts. And I think that's part of what makes him amazing and interesting. And I think that's part of what's gonna make today fun. And so with that, I'll let you guys go. Amazing, yeah. I actually wanted to start off with a question about how kind of related to what you just said, James, about how you ended up writing this piece in the first place. So I was Twitter stalking you and I saw your tweet about Frederick uh, Wiseman, the filmmaker, and sort of his creative process. And he said that he doesn't like making thesis oriented films, like the final film, he called a report on what he learned in his, uh, like as a consequence of making the film itself. And I'm curious about how that applies to you and sort of how you found yourself observing these patterns and writing these pieces on TikTok in the first place? Uh, yeah, so Frederick Wiseman, for those of you who don't know, is this like super prolific documentarian. Um, he has a really interesting career. He kind of switched, uh, you know, when he was like 40 and he'd already had a career in a number of different fields, switched to becoming a documentarian. And from that point forward, he's made, seems like one documentary a year and there are these like epic documentaries that are like four to six hours long. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because his style of documentary is so different from most documentaries that you'll see. I think, for example, everyone in tech is talking about the social dilemma right now because it's really popular on Netflix and it has to do with the tech industry in a way. And for those of you who've watched The Social Dilemma, it pulls out a lot of the tricks of the trade of documentaries, right? It's got the talking heads, it's got, you know, uh, recreations, it's got very provocative music and everything. Then you watch a Wiseman documentary 
It has no graphics on screen. Often you have no idea who you're even seeing on screen. There are no talking heads. There's no voiceover. There's not even um, what they call non-diegetic music. Like there's no score or soundtrack at all. Uh, so I just watched this documentary, City Hall, which is about like local politics in Boston. Uh, and it's like just four and a half hours of you're watching like, you know, community meetings, you're watching the mayor give speeches to various, you know, committees. Uh, you're watching a inspector go through with a contractor who's building a house and asking about, you know, safety protocol and things like that. And, you know, he said that his technique is that he doesn't know what he's going to say when he goes to film his subjects. He finds it kind of during the filming process and in the edit. And um, when I was, when I left Amazon in 04, I moved to New York to become a filmmaker. I wasn't sure what I was going to specialize in, but I went to editing school. And after that, I became an editor for a while. And one of the projects I worked on was a kind of like a reality TV show, editing that. And reality TV is like the opposite of the Wiseman process. They basically go in and they're like, this is the thesis. We need to make this person look crazy. We need to make this look this way. And so it's very manipulative in the editing style. And I think the like longer I've had my blog, like more recently, I've, I've gotten into this process that's more like the Wiseman style where I just find subjects that are sort of interesting or intriguing to me. And then just start collecting a bunch of little notes and snippets about the subject. And then kind of like a film editor, then you go through and you're looking at all your footage or I'm looking at all my snippets and I'm trying to make sense of them and piece them together into some explanation that makes that thing a little less mysterious to me. So I think it's David Deutsch who often talks about, you know, like the power of a good explanation or that we're constantly in a struggle to find better explanations for things that happen in the world around us. Um, and so that's kind of like the TikTok thing for me because, you know, when, um, when ByteDance bought Musical.ly and they rebranded it TikTok, I didn't actually use it that much in the beginning. I'd use Musical.ly a little bit just to research it. But um, I thought that TikTok would mostly be the same as Musical.ly. Uh, and then I started seeing ads for TikTok everywhere. You know, that was when they had that like saturation campaign where people thought that they were spending, you know, nine figures per month on advertising. Um, I couldn't not see TikTok. It was on YouTube. It was on Instagram on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere. And everybody was like, this is a complete waste of money. And, you know, I think a lot of people today would still say that probably they're lighting a lot of money on fire. Um, but then kind of, and, and also, by the way, a lot of users of TikTok, the teens were describing TikTok as very cringy. And, you know, I would peek in at TikTok and, and it did remind me of like the theater click in high school, you know, doing like very like theater style performances and dances. And I was like, that's a niche that's not going to be that big. Um, so when TikTok actually, num the numbers started to look better, I just thought that was a mystery <laughs> to me. I wanted to know what had happened. Um, and what era I, was that, that that you started chasing that? That curiosity? I think it was just like sort of the start of this year, sort of just, you know, before the pandemic changed everything, you know, I started to see more TikToks being shared occasionally on Twitter, a lot of compilations on YouTube. And, um, and there were, there were more diversity of people making TikToks, which also interested me. From a social perspective, it's rare that something that is said to be cringy then suddenly becomes more accepted. I think I talked to my nephew about TikTok like a while back, maybe a year ago. He was like a sophomore in high school. And he was just like, oh yeah, like I don't use TikTok. That's like, no one, it's, it's, uh, it's very cringy. And then, you know, earlier this year, we were doing a family Zoom and I asked him about it. He was like, yeah, you know, it's starting to catch on. You know, sometimes you have to go there to find some of the things that are going on in your class in high school or to understand what people are talking about. So that's just like from a social status perspective, I think it's rare that something that is sort of on the fringes be and is seen as not cool becomes cool in this way. Um, so yeah, that was the mystery that got me thinking about TikTok and using it more. 
And um, it's not like I've ever worked deeply in social myself, but I think social is probably the most interesting consumer product category because it has, has like elements of human nature um, and group dynamics and things that maybe a more conventional consumer product doesn't. And so um, I often say like, I think we're at the end of the first era of social products. Uh, this first era that's ended with the dominance of, you know, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and uh, with the Snapchats of the world. Like, I think this is sort of a nice end point and people are wondering what the next era of social will be. Um, and TikTok kind of came along and, you know, while I wouldn't describe it as a pure social network, it's just interesting that it got traction in the, in the U.S., um, I wonder, do you, would you predict that the next things that we find start to depart from history in the same way that TikTok does? Is like, is this a, a galvanizing or transitory moment? Or is this like a special snowflake network that, you know, may mm -hmm. just sort of work for its own dynamics, but we'll see a little bit more of, you know, the more traditional path going forward? Yeah, you know, I think of um, the tech market and the modern world today as as, um, as resembling more of kind of um, an environmental ecology because there's just a sheer number of connections between humanity is much higher. You can start to analyze, I think, the tech market as more of an evolutionary system. Um, so in that case, I would expect actually many, many more ideas to be cloned more quickly um, and, and I think I've seen that just given the internet and you would expect that, that if there's some sort of like, if you consider it using evolutionary terminology, uh, if you expect some of the strategies of TikTok to have worked well and to be a, a form of like genetic mutation, you would expect other companies to adopt those. Um, we already see, you know, Instagram with reels and things like there's some degree of cloning happening. Um, I would expect to see more of that. And, and that cycle time probably gets faster over time. Um, the other thing is that I just think it's very hard to challenge a network effect company, a network effects driven company like Facebook by just copying their strategy straight on. It's almost like impossible usually to uh, beat a larger incumbent that way. So the fact that TikTok sort of came at it obliquely and sort of has become competitive with Facebook with a sort of non-standard strategy, uh, I would expect that more companies would learn from that. Yeah, and one big innovation that you talked about in your first piece especially is that TikTok skipped this social graph, right? Like I don't have to friend mm -hmm. anyone, I don't have to follow anyone. I literally mm -hmm. download the app, I go straight to the feed and it kind of learns what I like. So it kind of skips yeah. straight to the interest graph. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious about how you think about that in relation to this simultaneous move we're seeing towards a creator economy. And everyone's talking about Substack and these platforms where you're really like wedded to the one person. Mm -hmm. Whereas on TikTok, like someone could have one hit, you'll, you'll see their video, but you're not necessarily like developing. It's not so creator centric in a way. So how do you like see that interplay? Yeah, there are a couple trends, I think, in that question. Um, one is that, like, I think there's a paradox at the heart of social, uh, which is that on the one hand, I see a lot of startups, um, and ideas that hit my inbox that are sort of like, Hey, we're a new network built around, like you can go, um, I don't know, share this or talk about this with your friends. And if you try out these new apps, it always launches with a, you know, add friends and find people to follow it. And so I always find these apps really challenging because it's like, oh, I have to recreate another social graph and go through that. And I've already done that so many times. I just, and it's so hard, right? Because initially you'll just have such a tiny graph on these apps. And so that's, that's you know, on the one hand, it's very hard to take a social graph first approach and have any success versus, versus the large incumbents. Um, but on the other hand, I also think it's also true that because we are all so connected with everyone in the world now, we also kind of take the social graph for granted. Like I never feel like uh, I need a particular app just to reach a particular person anymore. I just assume there are like five different ways I can connect with anyone in the world. It's like if, 
So people who want to um, network with me, I'm always like, just tell me like, what app do you want to use? Do you want to use WhatsApp? Do you want to use Telegram? Do you want to use Twitter, Instagram? It, it actually, I'm like completely agnostic to all of that. So the switching cost is both, it's like both high and low simultaneously. Um, the interesting thing about the creator economy bit, which I think is a separate question, is just that if you're a creator and you have an audience that you serve, there's always a trade-off in using a YouTube, um, an Instagram, a Twitch. You don't really own that customer list directly. And uh, your monetization options are always limited by that middle person whose incentive is going to be slightly different, right? They're trying to take a cut in mediating that transaction. And if they, you know, so you're constantly as a creator asking, like, do they provide enough value for me to give them this amount of rake? It's the same question that everyone's asking about the app stores right now, given that Epic and a bunch of people are like, fighting against Apple about the 30% rake there, right? They're just like doing the math in their head. Is the promise of distribution through the app store worth giving up 30%? And that's the same for even influ uh, individual creators. And so I would expect that as the competitive offerings for individual creators get better, more and more people will opt for something where they have full control of their stack. Um, there's probably like a lighter weight uh, creator stack that doesn't uh, have to be mediated through like some large social network. Um, and in fact, right, like if you're a powerful YouTube creator today, um, you know, if you're like, look at David Dobrik, for an example, he kind of hedges, right? He hedged his bet from YouTube and switched over to TikTok, started an account there, quickly built up a huge following there. He's to the point where he's like, look, in the beginning, yes, super useful for him to have YouTube's distribution and access. But once people are like, hey, I'm loyal to David Dobrik and I'll follow his content anywhere, then that leverage is reduced. And um, I expect you'll see the breakout creators sort of more and more say, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't need this social graph mediated middleman to sit in between me and my audience. So and do, do people use YouTube in that, that kind of example? Are they able to build like direct relationships through email or do they sort of move audience from a YouTube to a TikTok and sort of, they're still at the, you know, sort of uh, the rule, you know, the playing field of, of another kind of platform. Yeah. I, I think ultimately for a lot of creators, it's, it's less even about necessarily owning the direct email list and more about like, what is the monetization rate? that you can achieve with that. Mm -hmm. uh, look, if YouTube's monetization were stronger, uh, if Twitch's monetization were stronger, uh, a lot of the creators would probably be like, I actually don't need to deal. I don't want to deal with the hassle of <laughs> dealing with all of this myself, managing my own like stack for selling merchandise or sending email or anything like that. Um, but as long as there's an arbitrage opportunity on monetization, some people are going to take that leap and say, it's worth it for me to actually go my own way. Uh, and so, you know, the general pattern I would expect is today that that set of tools for creators is it's a little like a, a bit of a mess. There's a lot of like horizontal solutions like Patreon and whatnot. And if you're a powerful creator, you kind of have to stitch them together. I imagine over time there will be some vertically integrated solution um, like a creator tech stack that just is like, you know, uh, creator disintermediation in a bundle right. type mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, you know, you have Substack, which is like a version of that for writing. Um, but there will probably be some sort of like multimedia version that's like, hey, we can handle merchandise for you. We can handle your email list. We can distribute your videos and photos. Um, we can do live streaming, all of that thing, all in one. Do those kinds of tools, I guess they sound like they're more utilitarian in nature. So do they end up themselves having a tough time, you know, differentiating or building enough value for a given creator? Like I've heard, you know, for example, um, people say that, you know, when they get big enough on Patreon, they oftentimes start looking at other platforms that may not, you know, they may have sort of a different rake uh, because yeah. it's, I think, less of a network and more of a utility. Uh, yeah. do, do you think that that's like a, 
a problem for the technology companies trying to address this, or do you think there are still opportunities to kind of be full stack providers and end up really serving creator economy kind of as a full stack? Yeah, uh, I think it just comes down to, you can look at an X, Y axis where the X axis is, um, let's call it the uh, rake that you take, and then the Y axis being the value you provide. Um, and a lot of that value will be sort of like measured in traffic or revenue. And you can just draw a diagonal line there. There's some curve, right? And if you are below that curve, then creators are going to get antsy and be like, oh, I don't know if the value is worth the price. And if you're above the curve, they probably don't get antsy and they will not churn out. So that's, that's consistently the trade-off. Um, I think the nice thing about a vertically integrated stack here is... Um, to be honest, like, you know, when you look at the app store taking 30%, um, you're, th there probably are a lot of these like middlemen who take too much um, ultimately. And they could in the, in the beginning because there were just no alternatives. Um, uh, but over time, if you, if you are like, look, we are going to build out just this direct tech stack for creators to reach people, but we don't have the overhead of a, uh, large company that has to support a lot of other lines of business that aren't directly related to this just single purpose, then we can charge a lower take rate. Um, so I think that's, that's continually the struggle. Um, a lot of people on chat are kind of talking about this like ludicrous seeming spend that TikTok had initially to sort of fill up its community and acquire users. And George had a really interesting comment from like watching that at Facebook and thinking that it was ridiculous. So I'm curious about how, how do you think about that? Like, how do you think about how much it's worth investing at the top of the funnel to mm -hmm. sort of get your initial communities filled out? And if other people here have thoughts too, like George, feel free to chime in as well. Yeah, first of all, hey Eugene, I'm George, also Hi. like I said, ex Facebooker, although oh. I, I knew you were at Oculus when I was at Facebook. Fortunately, I never had the pleasure of working with you, but uh, I found your writing to be super, super fascinating, especially as someone who came from within Facebook, mm -hmm. um, because you art articulated actually a lot of the weaknesses, fatal weaknesses, I'd say, that Facebook had in terms of kind of a user follow based graph and feed versus like interest based feed, mm -hmm. um, even before that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was uh, a PM on ads, I was actually a PM on like ads API, programmatic ads, okay. that entire stack. Um, yeah. And I saw actually all the spend from TikTok. Mm -hmm. like, and I was like dumbfounded for mm -hmm. a large part of it because they spent so much money. Yeah. Um, but I found your article and your explanation in terms of uh, using that initial user base as a way to bootstrap like an interest-based feed mm -hmm. to be actually a very, very good insightful explanation of like what they were doing when mm -hmm. they were spending all that money on Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, one of the things about the spend, I do think this about communities in general. There is some sort of like minimum viable scale for a community of interest. And uh, the advantage that TikTok had was, well, one, having a really wealthy parent is a really good thing here if you want to spend that much in ByteDance. But second, ByteDance had cloned Musical.ly um, in China with uh, Douyin. And uh, the irony is that Douyin became a lot bigger than Musical.ly in China. And if you use Douyin um, in China, you'll see that it's, it's in many ways like sort of a preview of the future of TikTok. It's used for a lot of um, diverse uh, purposes. There's a lot of commerce going on there. There's education. There's just like all like a huge variety of things. Um, all the major media channels use it as an ad channel for their TV shows and films. Um, so I think ByteDance had the confidence to say, well, TikTok's worth investing marketing spend in because it can be a lot more. Like we've seen it become a lot more in China. And so we think that's possible. So there's often that idea of the existence proof that just gives you the confidence to pull off such a bold move. Um, the second thing is that their CEO, um, Zhang Yiming, is, you know, has always wanted ByteDance to be a global company. And the United States is the most desirable market for um, a Chinese tech company to crack. So there was just sort of like this bold willingness to spend uh, like crazy. And uh, that was, 
that's interesting because, you know, in my first piece, I talk about how by spending that much, they were just actually just pouring like a huge number of people into the top of the funnel. Um, but maybe that was a necessary step to break out of the reputation of TikTok as kind of a cringy app for young teens, um, especially girls. Uh, making little lip sync and dance videos because that was Musical.ly's kind of reputation. And that that's where Musical.ly had kind of hit a, a ceiling. Um, it's hard to say in hindsight, if Musical.ly had decided to spend at that level, uh, could they have broken out? I mean, I'd argue that I think they would not have been able to without an algorithm that helped to do something with all those new people they were pouring in the top of the funnel. Um, so in a way, those worked hand in hand. You had the algorithm, which was just really fast and efficient at sorting people into different clusters of interests. And you had the marketing spend that just provided enough volume at the top of the funnel to give each of those sub-communities a level of scale that would allow it to exist um, uh, on an ongoing basis. I actually have a bunch of questions on that, but I'll try yeah. to restrain myself and, and ration the question slowly over time. Okay. But, um, one thing that I think a lot about is like, you know, if you think about the value that TikTok obtained by creating this community and this interest based feed and, and the high engagement they were able to get to, 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 to users of the application, right? Right. What percentage of the engagement value of TikTok do you think is because of better training data through single unit, unit feeds as a way of um, enabling more accurate training data? versus all the other features that they ship, like, you know, even just the presence of an interest-based feed versus like a user follow-based feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been working on this kind of like large diagram to try to explain all of TikTok's sort of like flywheel and all the little loops that, that connect within it. And it's a little bit of all those things really that kind of make it work. Uh, you both need, right, like, uh, so my second piece is about the importance of the trading data in making their algorithm work effectively. And that's definitely, you know, from all the, you know, machine learning experts and AI people I've talked to is a huge story in recent years. It's just like, hey, we have these machine learning algorithms. What if we just train them on a lot more data? And it turns out it's just like, there is actually a difference in scale between training on like a small amount of data and then just an enormous volume of data. Even if the algorithms themselves haven't, changed that much you hit this like breakthrough point where suddenly people are like whoa you know AlphaGo is <laughs> beating all the world's best go players or gpt3 like feels oddly like it can write like a human um so you know what, what was interesting about tiktok is it came into a space where it, it wasn't able to necessarily just go find a public you know publicly available mass store of data um, because its training data was were these really unique videos. And that's where the creative tools and the creative community of TikTok come into play. Um, TikTok's camera tools and filters uh, really are pretty uh, unique in my mind. They're pretty innovative. Um, I encourage people to try to make a TikTok. You'll, you'll both realize that it's not as easy as it looks, but that it's also easier than you would imagine it's that's the paradox at the heart of it like i uh i find that the fact that they can match like your videos with music like on the beat just like a simple advance right the fact that musically went to all the music labels and got licenses to use all the official music snippets that was just like a massive subsidy to the creative community you know in the world if any of you have ever made like a, a music video in the past just to upload to social media just that process was a pain. You had to go like rip or find an MP3 of the song you wanted to use. And you had to find the, the segment you wanted to use. You know, then that video might get pulled down if you upload it to YouTube for like copyright infringement. And you know, all these things were painful. And TikTok was just like, hey, actually a lot of uh, teen girls really want to make videos to music. We're going to make that legal and really efficient to distribute and really easy to do. You know, like if you're recording yourself lip syncing, um, using the TikTok tool. It's actually like pretty easy. You can just keep like looping the track until you get it just right. You can slide your uh, video forward and backwards to match it more precisely. All of these, these things made it possible for the community to make these unique videos. So, um, so that's why I think of TikTok as a closed loop system, right? It's, uh, 
it's, it is the tool that allows you to make the videos that its algorithm then trains on. Um, and that's just like, that's fascinating to me. Um, I haven't seen too many things in the world that are like that. Most of the machine learning algorithms um, I see train on large publicly available data sets, you know, Wikipedia, you know, uh, digitized books, um, large sets of photos. Uh, so I don't know. I, I just think that's interesting. And I expect that since machine learning algorithms are going to become more and more a part of the future of tech, that TikTok may be some sort of model for other startups and competitors in this, in this space. It, there's like a real thing you give up though with call mm -hmm. it like the single unit uh, yeah. feed unit for better, better training data. Yeah. And that is like you give up a lot in feed density. Yeah. In general, right. feed density is seen as a, as like a, you know, an important feature for higher engagement. Yeah. How do you think about that trade-off between feed density and single unit feeds for better machine learning training data? Yeah. It's interesting. Actually, in China, you, um, I was in a panel. Oh, gosh. I don't even remember the year now because pre-pandemic, all the years were merging. But uh, I was in China on a panel. And one of the other panelists was this uh, guy, Pan Luan, who um, some of you may have heard of through a piece he wrote called Tencent Has No Dream. Uh, which became like really viral on WeChat uh, was kind of a critique of Tencent's like sort of product strategy. Anyway, he gave a, a talk contrasting um, uh, Douyin, which is the uh, TikTok clone from another app in China called Kuai Show, which is very similar. It's also a short video app. Um, the funny thing to learn about China is that China is such a large market that products break themselves out by what tier of cities they serve. So there are apps that serve what they call tier one cities in China, you know, the Shanghai's, the Beijing's, these like really large modern cities. And then there are apps like Kuai Show that talk about serving tier three or four Chinese cities. Um, many of whom, like I, I think most Americans couldn't name a single tier three or tier four Chinese city, even though all those cities are like larger than New York City in population. And Kwai Show's interface, uh, unlike Douyin's, uh, shows you like a two by two column of thumbnails of videos. And you actually have to tap into a thumbnail before you initiate watching a video. And Kwai Show has explicitly differentiated themselves from Douyin in saying that like, Douyin is for tier one cities and, um, and it's about superstars. Like by dance will, has I think explicitly said before that Douyin is about making one creator into a star, like the Charlie D'Amelio sort of like uh, test case in the US. And Kwai Show, because they serve like more rural tier three or four cities will say, we're about uh, everyone getting some amount of traffic. Like we're more almost like socialist in, in our traffic distribution. Uh, TikTok is, is very much about creating superstars. And so, uh, I think they have a purity of strategy where they just lean into it, where they're like, look, the key for us is that our algorithm really works well at scale. And so that becomes paramount in our sort of design objectives is to make sure that like we're not, our, our key metric is not necessarily density um, for engagement purposes. Our, our key metric is actually like, hey, how effective is our algorithm in picking the right video for you to watch? so that you watch more and more and more of them. Um, and that, and I think there's a lesson in that, in that most of our large social networking giants probably are driven um, by engagement style metrics. That's just such an easy thing to measure, right? Like if you were gonna measure the performance of the newsfeed team or the Twitter algo team or the Instagram feed team, like what are you gonna measure them on? And one easy metric to just track over time is just, density and uh, density of engagement or volume of engagement. Even probably the algorithms themselves are designed around some engagement metrics, just as TikToks are. Um, but, you know, in, in that way, that metrics all often uh, start to then sort of dominate all your strategy. Uh, I think that can be a danger. Um, you know, when I was at Amazon in the beginning, 
I, I was in strat planning. So I was often working with Wall Street and sharing, like coming up with metrics to share with Wall Street. And these were also metrics that we tracked internally inside the company. Um, but the key was that like Amazon never had, like we never had that one singular metric that we were uh, trying to optimize above all else uh, because every metric has its sort of flaws or blind spots. Um, so, you know, ultimately when you say, Hey, we want to maximize engagement, there's probably another question beyond that. Right. Like there is some, like, your company doesn't exist to maximize engagement. Like that's not what the user is, is thinking. You're doing something else that causes them to engage. And that can be either positive or negative. Uh, in, engagement by itself is, is sort of, uh, has no sort of morality or value. It's just a thing that happens. Yeah, I wonder if we'll see social tools that look a little bit more the way like Netflix does where you know, their whole goal is to make sure that we're happy and we want to keep subscribing because it has great content, but mm -hmm. you know, we don't get flooded with push notice all the time. Like I think they use them fairly sparingly compared to, you know, a, a service like, like Facebook that's very, very aggressive about trying to you know, communicate every, every last right. detail. Right. And that's, that's the part of like, you know, if you're on the Facebook team and you're, you're pushing um, a lot of notifications right now because you're trying to maximize engagement again, like I think we all have probably had some app on our phone that's like driven us crazy where mm -hmm. we had to turn off the notifications because they were clearly like, please engage, please engage, please engage. And, and the problem is just, um, and I talked about this in my second piece, is that the, the trade-off um, in these feeds is also whether you can capture negative signal. And oftentimes you can be blind to negative feedback signals that aren't captured for a variety of reasons. Like, you know, if you're on Reddit, if any of you use Reddit a lot, they have downvote buttons and, and look, it's like terrible when you write a post and it gets downvoted a lot. People will be like, why are people downloading, uh, downvoting my post? And, uh, but you could also argue that interest-based networks do need negative signal feedback mechanisms just because ultimately a person is just gonna be like, uh, in a community of interest, does this interest me or not? And if it doesn't interest me, I have a gazillion other options to entertain me on my phone and I'm going to churn. And so you always end up with that tension. Do you want to have a negative feedback mechanism that may hurt some feelings and cause some amount of negative emotional valence in the community? Um, is that trade-off worth it so that you can improve the quality of recommendations to that person? Um, these are kind of like the balancing things that I think people are going to have to start figuring out as they design like the next generation of, of social products. Um, in uh, a separate piece I wrote, which was called status as a service. I, I talked about three axes that I use to classify um, social networks. Uh, status or social capital is one axis. Entertainment is another axis. And then utility is the third axis. And I think one key thing about the next generation of social is that, uh, so utility I define as like, the user is like, hey, I have some problem, I need a solution to it, you know? So like, if you're like, hey, I need to get across town, but I don't have a car, you can use Uber or Lyft or public transportation, you can walk, you can bike, those are all sort of different solutions. If you wanna pay somebody, you can use Venmo or cash or a credit card or, or whatnot. Um, entertainment is an interesting category because I think the world has changed on this axis in a big way. Entertainment to me is just sort of like, I don't, I don't even know how to define it, but I think everybody has sort of like a, a, a general intuitive sense of what entertainment is. But when I was younger, entertainment, I think, was more, red, uh, was more um, uh, segmented by space. What I mean by that is just, I would watch TV only in our family room because that's where our TV was. I would play computer games only in my bedroom because that's where my Mac was. I would listen to music in the car because that's where the radio and cassette tape player were. And I would watch movies in a movie theater because that's where the movies played. And then over time, the walls between all these media niches are start, have started to fall down. And now we have the smartphone, always connected to the internet, runs any type of generic app. So today, when you unlock your phone, you have instantaneous choice of any form of entertainment you want. 
you can play a game, you can listen to a podcast, you can listen to music, watch a film, watch YouTube, go to Facebook, go to Instagram. And what that does, I think, to that entire business is that all those forms of media have become essentially effectively close substitutes for each other. And we know in economics that when things can be substituted for each other, that suddenly if the costs or value of one um, goes down or up, it affects like the market share of that form of media. And I think one of the challenges for the Facebooks and Twitters of the world is that I think many social networks think of themselves as utilities, but they're actually a form of entertainment. And that that means that their competitive peer set is much larger than it previously was. So the most famous quote on this is just that Reed Hastings from Netflix has said, you know, our biggest competitor is Fortnite. And then he also says sleep, you know, sort of jokingly, but actually it's more the case that like Fortnite competes with uh, all forms of entertainment or media now. And by the way, like, I think if we were all being honest with ourselves, like a lot of social media for us is a form of just entertainment more than it's some form of utility. Um, and the, the second order of implication for all of this is that, you know, when I would go talk to these sports leagues, for example, when I was um, at various companies and would look at their ratings numbers over time and talk about, you know, video games and things like that, they would always be like, well, you know, our direct competitors are like Major League Baseball or the NFL, if, if you were talking in the NBA. But I actually think, you know, Fortnite actually is really a competitor, more of a formidable competitor to the NBA than um, the other sports leagues in many ways. And the implication is that in every axis of entertainment, your most frightening competitor is the competitor that's best at that axis in the world. So for example, some people are like, well, video games are different than movies because video games are interactive. You have a game controller and everything. And that is true. Like movies serve a different purpose than video games. However, if you're like a 13 year old boy and you have like an hour to kill. You actually now do have the choice of whether you're going to go play Fortnite with your friends from school or watch a movie on TV. And the fact that movies aren't interactive, like it doesn't matter to that kid. He's just going to be like, I'm in the mood for interactivity. And so I'm going to choose Fortnite. Um, so that just, you know, that I think is going to change the entire uh, dynamic of competition in that category. Yeah, super interesting. I want to uh, leave some time here. I know we're, we're uh, you know, 12 minutes before the, the end of our uh, advertised session. I know that Nadia has, uh, you know, a whole stable full of interesting questions. Uh, so okay. I don't even know which one we want to switch to, but uh, Nadia, let's uh, unmute and, and pick your favorite. Hey. <laughs> there's, so much, there's like so much interesting stuff. I think like I'll ask two questions that are okay. unrelated and maybe we can choose one. But sure. I think um, one thing that you wrote about that I think was relevant to like a question George brought up earlier was around like exploit versus explore algorithms. And mm -hmm. I'm curious if you think that like TikTok sort of has shifted the paradigm in terms of how companies are thinking about like surfacing content and creators. Um, and I think um, second question, which is similar but different, is I'm curious, like thinking about that as well as these different dimensions, like for new startups, like how should they think about entering consumer social? Like, do they have a chance to break through? Do they need boatloads of capital? Because I feel like it's so interesting that like TikTok has sort of successfully done this when like so many others have failed. Yeah. And I'm curious, like what sort of takeaways are there, especially if you have such entrenched competitors for sort of this yeah. time? Yeah, um, I'll try to go faster now. <laughs> Let's see, the explore exploit thing is interesting uh, for those who don't know, sort of like there's like different approaches to like kind of the uh, traveling salesman problem um, in terms of algorithms. But you can think of exploit algorithms as being like, you know, you like sugar, uh, I will give you a lot more sugar. Like I'll stuff your face with Krispy Kreme donuts and ex um, explore algorithms being more like, well, we know you like these things, but you might like this thing. We're not sure. Uh, we're going to try to broaden your tastes a little bit. Uh, I, I don't know that TikTok is unique in using an exploit algorithm. Like I think YouTube's algorithm is pretty heavily exploit based also. It's just that they had a different approach to gathering more features of data, uh, more parameters on which to base that 
um, exploit algorithm. And that sort of made the algorithm sometimes to me seem really sort of like prescient and eerie almost in how much it can glom onto my tastes. Uh, I think that uh, one thing I didn't write about in my piece was just that category by category, I think this strategy will differ in effectiveness. For example, with music, I think it's really, you know, Spotify is like a radio algorithm where you pick a song and say like, play more like this is pretty heavily exploit based. It usually does a pretty good job. If I pick a song, it's going to pick like a whole bunch of other songs that pretty much kind of sound like that. Um, but in podcasts, which Spotify is moving into, it's just like a much harder problem, right? Like podcasts are super long. They like jump around from subject to subject. The number of feedback mechanisms, uh, for the user to give feedback on different segments of the podcast are even uh, tricky and low. So it's very different from a um, TikTok where you can give like a high rate of feedback relatively quickly because the videos are really short. Um, you can get, you can like throw a video out to a thousand test users and get like a really good read on it very quickly. Um, so your second question on like going into consumer social, I think for sure it is, it is a hard space, right? Like consumer social tends to be like really binary in its outcome. Either you succeed wildly or, you know, most social startups will fail to capture any scale. Um, but I think TikTok does at least offer um, an alternative path for people thinking about that, right? And I talked before about the whole social thing, like any startup that I see today, which is like, hey, you have to build up a social graph before our app's going to be any good for you. To me, I'm just like, that's already dead on arrival. It's just too hard to get people now to like build a new graph from scratch. Um, either you inherit a graph or you don't rely on a, on a social graph at all. Uh, I think that gives you your best chance. And TikTok being like sort of like very interest video focused and pure play on that really, really helped it, I think. Um, they sort of leaned into it and you kind of, you know, that, that's what I would say you want to do on the consumer social is, is like lean into one thing, uh, probably try to do something interest graph based if possible, or at least not social graph based because the trade off you want to force a Facebook or Instagram or some large company to deal with is the internal trade off they have among all their constituents, right? Instagram has shopping, it has the normal feed, it has stories, it has the explore page, it has reels. The news feed has videos, it has text stories, it has people posting links to news stories, it has, you know, their TV shows. And, and there are always going to be like 20 constituents at every one of those companies fighting for share of news feed. Whereas you as startup can just pick one of those and be like, we're all about this thing, right? Like uh, TikTok is all about short meme videos. And Instagram can't be all about that. And Facebook can't be all about that um, because, you know, there's a whole bunch of groups and divisions working on competing products. So, yeah. I wonder what you think about um, these new networks that uh, kind of need to be able to work without a lot of network assembly to begin with. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about e-commerce mm -hmm. and that seems like a natural place where you know, something could, you know, your first touch point with the service could be around a commerce transaction. And then, you know, maybe there are other types of social or networked things to build around that. And I think you referenced, is it Pinduoduo in China is yeah. the one? You know, why, why haven't we seen anything like that? Or is that a good starting point for something that we might see emerge? Yeah, certainly since the, the giant in e-commerce in America is Amazon, and they have not done a good job with short video, you would think that short video commerce is, is a huge opportunity in the US considering that it is in China. Uh, I would caution though that like some things about China are somewhat unique. And one of the huge things is that China effectively has Amazon Prime like for everything. Uh, in America, you have to pay, I, I don't know what it costs now, like $140 for Amazon Prime, I think. Um, and, and, and for that, you get sort of like free two day shipping when you're in China and you're watching, like you're watching a commerce stream or short video commerce in any app, it, first of all, the payments is already integrated because everybody has WeChat Pay and Alipay. Um, it's kind of just like built into the phone essentially because everybody already has those set up. 
And so in an app, you just tap the buy. Like if you're watching Doing and someone's advertising something, you're like, I want to buy it. You tap the buy button, pops open a screen. And if there's some customization, maybe you choose the color of the shoe you are going to buy or whatever. And then it already has your address and it you know, already knows your payment credentials. So then you just hit buy. And then one to three days later, you will get that product delivered to you for free shipping. I mean, that's partially because just like the cost of labor for shipping in China is so low. Um, so that, that sort of makes short video commerce just a much larger market in China than it is in the U.S. Because, um, and I've written about this before, you know, like paying for shipping actually is a huge impediment to commerce. And also just the, the pain of entering your address, your payment credentials, setting up an account is just painful. Like if you ever see anything you want to buy on Instagram, um, you know, in the past, you got one of those ads, you had to tap and then you got an in-app web browser and you had to go enter all. It was just like very painful and high friction. And so I think that, that, that differs from China to the US. But over time, I do think uh, commerce and shopping, if you treat it as a form of entertainment, the way they do in China, um, that is a huge market. And I would expect to see that in the US more and more over time. Um, like, and, and there we'll, we'll be chasing China on that front. Makes sense. I think, uh, was, was Max going to jump in with a question? I think we had Max teed up. Yeah. Um, so you talked earlier about, you know, in tier one cities in China and, you know, how TikTok is trying to create like superstars. So how do you yeah. avoid a problem, you know, like a Vine or a Twitter? This is one of Nadia's questions as well like to, you know, avoid a problem where viewers loyalty is more, you know, to the content creator, like the David Dobrik's of the world than the actual platform. Yeah. Um, you ultimately, like if your platform has good enough discovery mechanisms, you can sort of avoid the fate of uh, losing all your top creators and having that like really impact your bottom line. Um, and a good example of that, I think was just Twitch with Ninja getting paid by Microsoft to go over to Mixer and then and eventually like coming full circle and coming back. Um, it turned out that, hey, you know, when a bunch of top creators left Twitch, most people just still went back to the Twitch homepage and found other stuff to watch. <laughs> and they were like, well, you know what? This next creator is also entertaining. I'll just watch that person on there. Um, so as long as your, uh, I guess, product or service is good at like helping people find interesting content um it will be somewhat immune to you know the top creators being taken away you know uh, the thriller thriller strategy of paying a bunch of top tiktok creators to leave i think ignores the fact that a lot of the power of tiktok was its ability to, through its flywheel to create stars and create new ones I think, I think TikTok is pretty immune to you paying um, a few creators to defect. Um, that's not to say that Charlie isn't like a media enterprise onto her, her own with her, her own draw. Like those both, both of those things can be true, that she can sustain a huge business, but also that you paying Charlie to switch over to your network is not going to cause TikTok to go away. In fact, TikTok really, you could say, made Charlie in a way or helped the world discover her. So who's to say they couldn't make more Charlies in the future or help discover more talent. Um, and, and ultimately if your product is really dependent on one talent or any way, your, your product probably isn't adding that much value anyway in the uh, overall scheme of things. Well, I think we, uh, I think we had a question from Nabil talking about the ninja situation. Oh, um, Hey, Eugene. Uh, hey. No, it's just, it was just looping back to what you were talking about very early. I feel like we kind of yeah. came full circle. Like we started talking about uh, an individual getting, you know, a discovery platform, creating a superstar. That superstar then has their own power and energy. And much like we're seeing in the cable networks, like, yeah. you know, disaggregation, I go start my sub stack, I go separate. Yeah. But uh, um, and for monetary reasons or whatever, the ninja situation is interesting in that it, it, it you know, ninja's numbers went, went down uh, pretty mm -hmm. drastically, but he still had a business over at Microsoft because Microsoft was paying a salary. Yeah. Uh, didn't seem to hurt Twitch at all. Yeah. How do you, how do you kind of like reconcile 
this idea that as people get big enough, the platform won't succeed when the kind of examples that we have this happening, at least at really mass level, not like, you know, a small newsletter level, but at really mass level, it doesn't seem to be occurring just yet. Yeah, I think this is just the, uh, goes back to that trade-off curve of sort of value versus price that these stacks offer. And I think Substack will have that to some extent, right? So you will always have like, um, there's some power law curve in effect around uh, a lot of creative communities. So let's say you become a massive success on Substack and you have, you know, a million subscribers. Well, you're going to start looking at the fee that Substack charges you and saying, huh, what if there was like a, another option that I can migrate my email list over to and they took like half the take rate? Well, suddenly I've just doubled my income over the year. Like, is it, like, is Substack driving that subscriber count for me or am I the reason that they subscribe to me, right? Um, a platform has power in proportion to the, its ability to drive an audience for you. And at some point, if you become the draw for that audience, then that value from that platform diminishes in your mind. And you're like, hey, no, I'm, I'm Oprah. You know, I, I can make my own network. I don't need ABC to, and that's just like, you know, that happens. <laughs> it's a natural part of the ebb and flow of platforms. At that point, the platform can decide. I mean, they could do a number of things. They could be like, look, we're gonna discount your pricing because you have such volume which is just like a natural strategy that many companies and many verticals do. Uh, or if they can let that person leave and just say, look, um, it's not worth it to us either to try to fight to keep that person because we can create many more people like that. Um, so I think, you know, TikTok's an interesting balance. On the one hand, they're like, we want to create superstars. But on the other hand, they're also, I think like, well, if the superstars end up leaving, that's also probably okay with them because they feel like they can create more of them um, in the future. Is there something about the format as well that might lean itself towards disaggregation or not? Like, like um, if I'm part of a massive discovery newsletter service platform that doesn't exist right now, right? The, uh, mm -hmm. Me separating and sending you emails is, is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But, um, and if Ninja is on eight hours a day, and I only love Ninja, then I, I might get enough entertainment simply out of the Ninja network as its own yeah. thing. Right. But uh, short form TikTok seems much more resilient to disaggregation given I don't, even if I like two TikTok stars, I've just filled yeah. three <laughs> minutes every yeah. day maybe, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, that, that for sure is in play too. Uh, you know, to, to be like an independent media empire uh, I think people underestimate, for example, like how much, um, if you know Addison Ray, she's also like behind Charlie, a huge star. Uh, or if you look at like an Emma Chamberlain or some of these stars, I mean, the, the amount of time <laughs> that they spend making content, it's a crazy like around the clock type job. I mean, it's pretty hard to be even like an Oprah. Oprah eventually had to have a network where she had other creators in it just to sustain an, an entire channel. So um, yeah. There's certainly some, there's some limit to, I think, what, what a single person can do. Well, I want to be uh, sensitive to the time check. Uh, I know we have sort of run, run through our kind of hour that we had planned. I think there's tons and tons of questions in the chat. So we yeah. should probably keep I'm going happy. for three yeah. hours. We won't, we won't keep it that long. But <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to take a few more if, if people have more. Um, cool. I saw yeah. another one from George that looked interesting. George, do you want to go? Yeah. yeah. So Eugene, one of the yeah. ways that I think about like generalizing a lot of your observations is you can kind of apply this formula. Um, okay. The formula goes something like single unit feed formats, mm -hmm. results in better training data, results mm -hmm. in better recommendations, mm -hmm. results in better interest-based feeds, which in many situations may be better than other feed formats. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe better mm -hmm. than user follow-up yeah. feed, maybe better yeah. than user feeds. There's, there's a lot of trade-offs yeah. you can make, right? right. Um, and in, in many different ways, if you think about it, you know, that exactly to your point, that is what TikTok is. Yeah. Um, and when I was trying to think of like applying this to other industries, my initial reaction is like, oh, this is just TikTok because their short form videos is really easy to sort of assess. It's really yeah. easy to sort of decide whether this is good or bad, right? Yeah. But one of the points that you brought up in your article is that this also applies not only to short form video, but also photos based dating in the form of Tinder, mm -hmm. right? 
And mm -hmm. one of the examples you brought up in your first article that I thought was super, super interesting and funny was the example of NewsDog. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I assume they apply some version of that to text-based news, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to short form based video, social network and photo based dating, right? Yeah. Although when I looked at news dog, I don't have the app, I have an iPhone, yeah. like it looked more like a traditional feed yeah. rather than like a single unit based feed. So I'm not sure what's happening there. Yeah. Um, but kind of my question is like, what other products and industries do you think are natural fit for this kind of formula? Yeah. Um, I wanted to write more about this in my second piece, but then it got too long. And so I just cut that whole piece out. Like, I think you, I don't know that I have the full answer here, but I do think that you know, TikTok as an example, won't work in every category. I talked just now about music and podcasts and sort of the challenge with really long form things. I'll bring up another area where I think this is hard, uh, which is movies. So Netflix famously had the Netflix prize for a million dollars. They were trying to come up with like this magic recommendation algorithm. And if you look at Netflix's homepage today uh, and look at all the carousels, you know, most of them are not algorithmically you know, driven. They are like on the fringes, but a lot of it like is just like, Hey, we made this like new movie or show and we're just going to put it in the top slot and try to make a lot of people watch it. And movies are a category that are classically hard to do recommendations in one, because uh, most people don't watch that many movies per year. Movies are super long. Um, even if I say I like Westerns, that doesn't mean I like, I like every Western. Uh, so you just have like a really low volume of training data. Um, the reason why someone likes a movie it can be really complex to distill uh, the same way that you can do for a short video. Um, I think it's underrated how much almost every TikTok has like a really catchy music track to it, right? It makes repeat watching just very inherently pleasurable because you're just hearing this like chorus drop like um, over and over. Um, so I don't know when I was at Flipboard, we worked, we switched over to an algorithmic feed at one point to try to recommend news stories. And we had some of the same problems that movies had for that. Like most of the articles we had to analyze each day were brand new. We had never seen them before. Um, they were very long and not many people actually read most articles like from beginning to end. Uh, and so like trying to understand, like, let's say, you know, James is really into business strategy and we get 50 new business strategy articles in a day. How can we pick the right one that James will be really interested in? Well, what TikTok would do, right, is they would take all those articles and then serve them to a thousand people and then try to watch like what they would do. It's actually kind of hard to do with articles. Um, most people won't even go through the entire article. So you're, it's like, is it because they don't like the article? or because they just don't like reading that much. Um, what about it? It's just like uh, a challenge. Like there's so much new content. And then the problem with news content was also that the decay value of news content is so high for a lot of articles. Um, if you recap a baseball game from the day before, that has value for about half a day. And then it has like almost no value at all. No one wants to see it anymore. How do you, you know, distinguish between that? So. Uh, in many ways, TikTok is sort of like somewhat of an ideal because those videos are almost like evergreen. They're very short. You get a high volume of, of data. Um, Toutiao, which was ByteDance's first big breakout app, which was a news app in, uh, like they always call it the algorithmic news app in China. Well, if it turns out, if you look at their content in the early days, first of all, it was mostly photos. And secondly, even if you look at it today, it's a lot of BuzzFeedy like content. People call it a news app, but I think when people say news, you think of like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, like heavy news. It's actually just more kind of entertainment, clickbaity type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to the extent you're like doing like um, fluffy entertainment content like that, engagement is usually a pretty good feedback mechanism. But to the extent that you're doing something that's not um, as like fluffy or entertainment based, it becomes trickier to determine quality. Uh, and that is one of the unsolved problems that I think people will have to think of if they've tried to replicate the, uh, TikTok strategy. Yeah, I thought, I think that's super interesting. And I'm curious if you have any point, uh, any thoughts on how you think 
long-form content discovery could be better in text or film or these areas that are mm -hmm. way trickier? Do you think it's by necessity more manual? Like you really just need, seems like most mm -hmm. recommendations I get are from mm -hmm. my friends. So maybe it goes back to social graph. Sure. Yeah. Like for example, at the film, in the film world, I still find like certain friends of mine uh, who are film buffs or certain critics that whose taste I match with, like I still trust them over an algorithmic recommendation. And it may just be that like, that may be a good thing that manual curation still has a role to play in many categories. Like I actually find that to be a, a good thing that like algorithms haven't unlocked or figured out exactly how to uh, take over for all of human taste. Um, one thing that, you know, for example, for longer types of content, what we may, might need is actually better feedback mechanisms that allow us to capture passive feedback in a, in a um, more low friction way. Uh, in film school, I went to this really cool lab once, which did eye tracking. And obviously I'm not saying that we should do eye tracking for everything, but afterwards, so we would watch a movie and we were wearing these like, um, and they had these cameras set up. They could like look at what part of the screen you were looking at. And, and they did this to teach us about cinematography. It's like, hey, if you frame a shot this way, people will look at this part of the screen. And you know, that's one of the techniques about cinematography. Um, usually when someone is watching a Netflix film, the only feedback you have is just how far into the thing they watch before they churn out. Um, and so, you know, look, uh, someday in the distant future and people either will either think this is like dystopic or they will think like, hey, the recommendations are so much better that it's worth it. You may be able to capture like biometric feedback um, in a more real-time basis because of whatever, something like your Apple Watch or, or something like that. Um, I read about this funny experiment once, which I think it was two Microsoft people who did this. It was a married couple and they put like some sort of emotional... I don't know, reading sensor. Uh, it was either the wife put it on the husband or vice versa. And that would allow uh, him to look at his Apple watch and see whenever his wife was upset by something he said or something. I can't remember what it was like that. And it led to a bunch of like really comic situations where, uh, you know, ultimately he was like, this is like not good. I want to take it away. But um, I, I think that's always the inherent tension is, if you capture feedback from me, are you using it to make my life better in some way? And if you are, I'm probably willing to do that. Like this is the whole privacy debate that we have in tech. We go around and around on it. Uh, I think most users are going to be like, look, I'm okay with some level of my privacy um, being invaded, but like you better like make use of it in a way that makes my life better. Otherwise I'm not going to put up with it. And so um, that may be one path towards things. You know, I'm, I wish that the Kindle, for example, you know, if you're an author and you wrote a book and you put it out on the Kindle, it would be great to get more granular feedback on, you know, hey, where do readers get stuck? Or where do readers turn out of my book? Um, which, which parts cause them to read more quickly? Uh, which parts cause them to read? And, and is there a way to capture more of that feedback? Uh, midstream in, in a long form piece of content. Um, today, we just don't have that for most writers. So it's hard to get uh, a better read. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I also have a like total zoom out question. Mm -hmm. of what do you think? Like, where's the bottom line? What do you think? We're talking about why TikTok succeeded, but how much of this is actually good? For the future of our relationships and kind of society and how do you think people should think about balancing algorithm friendly design with like truly human friendly design if that makes sense like with all the attention economy discussion mm -hmm. and going on yeah wow that's uh that's a tough question um i i think that the one thing that we you know, probably have to draw a line in the sand on, or we, we just have to contemplate and talk about more explicitly is just that 
there is just a level of opacity to machine learning um, recommendations. Like, yes, like, you know, if you talk to someone, they'll be like, well, we can just show you exactly what the software code says. Like, you know, there, there's no opacity there. But I think that ignores the fact that like, when so much of our uh, so much of our lives are driven by algorithms, there is a way in which like the scale of it becomes impossible to wrap your arms around, and, and you don't really know what it's doing other than the algorithm is like really hungry to exploit certain runaway feedback loops in human sort of like attention, you know, how our minds work, how our bodies work, and we know historically that there are certain traps that you could put people into, which are like kind of addictive loops, which are really powerful. And, you know, we have to make a, uh, I think a judgment about whether that's like what we want. Um, and we, and we want to make that decision more explicitly than to have it happen sort of just like without us thinking about it, which I think is a lot of the debate about social media today is that a lot of people are like, oh man, it's caused us to all be angry or emotional or outraged, like buttons are being pushed. And, and part of the dismay that a lot of people feel is that it sort of feels like it happened without us like explicitly making a choice about it. Like if you watch The Social Dilemma, uh, it's a little bit like people who worked on these products were like, oh, I didn't know that it was going to do this. And now I feel badly about that. And I think a lot of society is sort of just like, wow, like we didn't really explicitly make a decision that like society was going to talk to itself this way. Uh, but now it does. And we can't put that genie back in the bottle in a way. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm very much a McLuhan-esque type of, uh, person when it comes to media. And I really do think that the dominant mediums that we use really affect society. And the fact is that social media is increasingly like the dominant method by which um, citizens talk to each other, or understand or perceive each other in a nation state. And, and it is also true, I think, that that... Um, that has put enormous stresses on sort of the chief narrative that we use to conceive of ourselves as like one country. And the problem is that like our politicians, a lot of our like more traditional intellectual elites, I think are still using very uh, old or outdated forms of media as like the primary way to push the narrative of, you know, ourselves as a country. And yeah, that increasingly like the, the, uh, the largest optimal, I guess, like governance unit of society is, is shrinking. Um, and that's, I think the stress that we feel right now. Um, and it's, it's not that I want to go back to the previous world, but I hope that like in understanding social media better and its dynamics around status and like social relations better, we can be a little bit more like uh, ahead of the curve when we make those decisions in the future. Um, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. It, it reminds me a bit of uh, this idea this author James Williams was talking about with us. Uh, he wrote a book called Stand Out of Our Light. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be having him on here uh, in a, I guess a couple of weeks away, but uh, he talks about how technologies and platforms have goals for us. And mm -hmm. those are not always consistent with our own goals for ourselves. Yeah. And if a platform starts to optimize around goals for itself, kind of ignoring the goals of the people who use it or the goals of the, uh, the society in which it lives, you can get some pretty uh, obscene you know, outcomes yeah. from, from such a thing. <laughs> we traded like one set of gods for another. Um, mm -hmm. In a previous world, when I remember growing up, like there were like, you know, one or two, two major newspapers in Chicago, you know, and I can even remember a time and I'll be dating myself when there were only like three news channels like ABC, NBC, and CBS. And um, because of the economic incentives for all of those, they wanted to appeal to the broadest audience. Everything was sort of like watered down and bland. Um, but that gave us an illusion that we were all kind of the same. I, I just kind of felt like, hey, you know, the average American is just kind of like me. Like we're all like roughly the same points of view. Uh, 
And then you look at the explosion of cable and like the world of like a thousand TV channels. And how do you stand out in that world, right? And how do you compete to get carriage fees and ad revenue? Well, then the optimal strategy is for you to actually appeal strongly to a niche. And so I always say that the three biggest developments in media in my lifetime um, uh, were uh, one, the creation of Fox News, uh, two, the rise of the internet and social media, and then three, the Great Firewall of China. Uh, because I think all three of those are like an example of how when you structurally change media in a big way, it actually has a huge ripple effect on, you know, society and on the narratives that we used to believe in to unite us, whether those were like the idea of me being a citizen of the United States or me being a Catholic or, you know, whatever those grand narratives were. We now have this like media structure, which has fragmented and put pressure against older narratives. Um, and I often, uh, you know, think of this world of, of when I thought everyone was similar to me and how the internet has made it so that like, I think a lot of us are actually really horrified by our fellow person, whether that's a fair assessment or not. You're just like, oh my gosh, this person's views are so different from mine that I actually don't see any path towards reconciliation with that person. Like it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, whereas in a previous life, you might've just like, you know, met that person, um, sat next to them at a bar in a restaurant and had a normal conversation and not, um, have thought twice about it. And so the way that we talk to each other and the way that, um, our media sort of mediates those conversations really changes the nature of, you know, what it means. I don't know if you watched the debate last night. I know I did. And you know, I, I felt like it was just epitomized this feeling I had of just, you know, it was just two people screaming at each other with like completely polarized viewpoints. And there's like no, there was no center ground <laughs> uh, to cover there, right? Like it didn't even feel like there was any overlap, uh, whatever. It was like two magnets repelling each other. And I do, I do wonder then about how nation states will sort of hold together its citizens when we no longer have like that one shared story, or maybe you can argue that it was just a myth the whole time and that we always had all these differences. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. What well, seems like the, the continued evolution of the media tools that we have uh, are likely to sort of have an, a big impact in how we identify with each other and how we identify with kind of national narratives. So I think it's, yeah going to continue to be exciting to, to kind of read from your writing and think about how, um, how you think deeply about media. And then we're always going to be excited to learn about the new tools that are coming and the sort of different incentive structures that they have around it. So I, I'm sure and I hope that you'll keep writing about this because these are important topics and we find that uh, you're thinking on it super interesting. Um, Absolutely. So with that, uh, I do want to start moving towards wrap up. Uh, we do have our one final question that we like to ask, and we'll okay. save that for an end, uh, okay. for a final end. But um, uh, I first want to do a few quick announcements. So um, first, uh, this has been so awesome, and we are coming to the end of the time. But I wanted to first thank you, Eugene, for coming to join us, for sharing all of your thinking and knowledge with us. Super interesting. So Thank you for having me. That so was great. Fun. <laughs> um, and then uh, a few quick announcements on some upcoming stuff. Uh, We've got some future town halls at our Discover page. So um, we'll link that in the chat at highlighter.com slash discover. Um, we have a lot more questions for Eugene. So we're gonna start looping these things in on a, we'll start off a Twitter thread that helps kind of uh, distill some of the questions that we didn't get to tonight. Mm -hmm. I actually think there's a lot more uh, energy in the room here than we actually have time to prosecute. Uh, coming up, we've got a few good sessions. Um, Scott Belsky and Annie Duke are talking about their books, and Tomas Tungus, Tungus is talking about his blog, Narrative Economics. Uh, and uh, so now we're ready to conclude with our questions. So we sort of spent the whole uh, session tonight asking you questions about your writing, and we want to give it the chance to turn the tables, and we want to hear kind of what's on your mind. And so kind of what is your question either to us or to the world more broadly, what's, what's kind of top of mind for you and what kind of piques your curiosity these days? Oh, wow. Um, that's a tough one. 
Uh, <laughs> and it can it can be it can be <laughs> flippant. It can be serious. You know, you can take it sort of in whatever direction. So maybe it's a new platform that you're thinking about, or maybe it's a you know something political or whatever whatever's top of mind. Well, I do think uh, there are two things that um, I find interesting right now. One is that if you look at this whole creator economy and you look at the history of creators, uh, most of the value of the work that creators or artists make has accrued in history to large intermediary distribution companies, uh, publishing houses, music labels, movie studios, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was just driven by the cost of distribution itself. Um, and marketing and, and all of that. And in a software-based world, a lot of that cost of distributing actually goes closer to zero, even though the cost of discovery is still relatively high. Um, but what is, what, what might cause um, an inflection point where we finally have um, a more sort of like broad-based direct to customer model for the entire creative class. Um, I think it differs by medium, but that's something I think about a lot, even when I think about what I'm gonna work on in the future. Uh, I think that's just a healthier relationship generally for creatives to talk directly to their audience. And the second is when I look at machine learning algorithms and things like that, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert in this category, um, but I do, I'm very curious about how that impacts creative work generally in the future. You know, something like GPT-3 um, as a writer is fascinating to me. I'm like, what does that do for me as a writer? Like, where's the value for me as a writer? Or how do I work in partnership with an AI to make my work better in some way? Like, can it be something that supplements my thinking in writing rather than... Uh, just being something that like we see as displacing me as a writer. Um, that whole field I think is sort of interesting to explore. <laughs> it's like, how can we use the, that AI as more leverage for us as creators rather than feeling like we're in competition with it? Yeah, so just like, like all tools, it could be an extension to support human work instead of kind of a replacement. Yeah. Good. Well, and that, uh, that's a nice kind of bit of optimism and questions about the future. So I think with that, we'll, we'll call it an end to the session tonight. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks again to James for providing the introduction to Eugene and Eugene for providing so much great thinking for us. Today. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Those were great questions. I really enjoyed it. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night.